Chairman Lozano, thank you so much for thank sitting you, down Luke. and talking to us. Absolutely. Uh, you know, it's really interesting because in, in Texas politics, one of the things I've found is people you disagree with one day, you agree with the next. Uh, it's really important to kind of understand that maintaining relationships, treating people with respect is always important. And I think my hope with today's conversation is that it encourages people across all political spectrums to understand that the way you treat people and the way the legislative process is handled is really important and sometimes even becomes more important than whether you agreed on a certain bill in the past or things like that. You are a former Democrat. In your defense, you were a Democrat for like less 14, than two years. 14 months. <laughs> 14 months. <laughs> yeah. So you run and you ran as a pro-life, pro-gun, pro-business, pro-welfare reform. Welfare reform. Yeah. Democrat, you get elected in South Texas in 2010. You come here, you serve one session, and literally within 14 months of being sworn in, you switch to the Republican Party. Talk to me about some of the things that motivated that initial switch back in 2011. Well, um, as I came in, uh, considered myself a conservative Democrat. I believed at the time that there was room for a conservative Democrat because we're Texas. And as I got in, uh, before we uh, began the process of filing legislation, we had the first Democrat caucus meeting of the, of the House. Um, and that election cycle, many Democrat incumbents lost. Uh, Abel Herrero lost from my neck of the woods. Solomon Ortiz Jr. lost from my neck of the woods. Um, Who's now running again. Yeah, he's running again. <laughs> and so they were all licking their wounds. And I saw what happened. They were campaigning on progressive values. And that's not Texas. And so what I said in this caucus meeting at the very end, uh, they asked, Is there, does anyone have any questions or does anyone want to say anything? And no one, everyone was quiet and real beat up. And I raised my hand and I told him, you know, hey, I'm J.M. Lozano from Kingsville. Um, and I just want to say that based on what transpired this next, this last general election, this party needs to be the party of small business, not all the other far left stuff, because that's not Texas. And the chair at the time of the caucus looked at me and said, OK, anything else, anyone? <laughs> just like that. And I knew at that moment that it was going to be a rough session. I didn't say anything to them, uh, but I knew that I was just going to vote my heart in my district and let the chips fall where they may. Um, as the session got underway, uh, I was uh, put on the Energy Resources Committee, which oversees oil and gas in Texas. Um, I was one of two Democrats, and I think that these environmental groups thought, oh, he's a Democrat, we're going to go to his office. And they wanted me to support a ban on drilling because of a salamander. And I, and I look, looked at them like, kind of like, is, am I being punked or something? And at, at some point, I said something like, have you researched my district, where I'm from, where I grew up? Oil and gas jobs are, are precious and they, they're life changing for generations. Um, plus, it's a property right. You as a landowner have the right to develop your, your property, um, and it fuels the economy. Um, and I think one of them rifled through paper and went, oh, just like that. That O oh was so meaningful because they stopped coming by my office. Um, I mean, if you look at my office, I've got uh, a buck mounted on the wall, a bobcat fetching a quail, and groups that don't like hunting or or uh, that don't respect the rights to bear arms, stopped coming by my office. And they were like confused. Um, fast forward to a couple of weekends into session and I'm home and our neighbor down the street, I think she chaired the Republican party, who's a friend of ours. Uh, she came to our house and I heard her voice talking to my wife and I came out, hi, how are you? And she's like, well, what are you gonna do this session? And I told her, and she said, well, why are you a Democrat? 
I would have voted for you if I knew that you were saying those things. But, and, and at that moment, I hadn't really thought about, I was too busy thinking I need to get more conservatives to come out and be conservative and not be afraid in the Democrat party. Um, so How old were you when you got elected? 30. Yeah. 30. Yep. I campaigned when I was 29. Yep. Uh, one. And um, as, as legislation started to, to unfold, um, I was voting pro-life. Uh, Sid Miller, uh, a rep at the time, had the sonogram bill. Um, I voted for it, uh, pro-life. Um, there was uh, legislation that was cutting taxes. Uh, I voted for that. Um, you, you have talked about the way Democrats would confront you after you would vote for a pro-life bill. That's before. right. Can you, can you explain? I love kind of helping people see the side that the, the, the camera doesn't capture. Yeah. So what happens when you're a Democrat and you vote pro-life? How do some of your Democrat lawmakers approach you? What do they say at that point? Two experiences that session that I think really just solidified what, what I was going to do. The first one was uh, Sid Miller had his bill and I was voting for the sonogram bill. Uh, uh, abortion does not align with, with my faith or with that of the communities I represent. Um, the caucus chair at the time was a rep named Jessica Farrar from Houston. She comes on my desk and she has a manila folder with a list of uh, a spreadsheet of all these names and phone numbers. And she said, if you don't change your vote, we're gonna do a robocall against you this evening. And, you know, I'm a freshman, I just gotten elected. This is the first overt threat mm -hmm. I have had. And I open the thing and I start rifling through the paper and literally I look at each page, like the first five pages, and like half or more than half of the names on there are my dad's patients. My dad's a doctor in South Texas. Yep. Many of those he delivered. And I'm like, ma'am, do you know my district? And I said, you're from Houston. I know Houston in general, but I don't know your specific district. You're threatening me. I hope you know my district. You have, you're holding a folder of my constituents' names. Do you know my district? Well. I just had to tell you that if you don't change your vote, we're going to do a robocall against you. And I said, do whatever you think you're going to do, but it's not going to work. I don't know if they ever did the robocall or not. Um, I did go complain to some of my fellow colleagues from South Texas who I consider conservative as well. And, and they, I think they kind of got her off my back for voting in my district, but that was the first experience. There were others in the middle. And at the very end of session, the one bill I had that was for my district and essentially for Texas, but it was right now we're everyone's talking about border security because the border's a mess. Back in 2011, I had a bill that was going to give property owners immunity from frivolous lawsuits brought by those evading arrest. Very broad term, specifically an illegal alien that dies on your property because a truck flips cannot sue the landowner. And there were tons of bailouts happening in my district. Um, chased by border patrol, the trucks veer off into a ditch, go cut through fences, and sometimes people fall out and die. Mm -hmm. They were suing the landowner in my district. And so various liberal groups are killing my bill. I go to Governor Perry and he tells me, go to this rep, he has a bill that's coming through from the Senate and work it out. And I attached it on a bill late at night. And as I attached that amendment, the, I don't want to say his name, uh, the, but the largest, wealthiest trial lawyer in Texas called my cell phone on the house floor. Not, it's a blocked number, but I answer it. And he tells me who he is. And I said, yes, sir, how are you? And he's like, if you're the only one that can pull down that amendment now. You need to go up there and pull it down. Uh, no, I'm not. This, this bill is for my constituents, and it's also just common sense. Property ownership should not be a liability. It's bigger than that. Go up there and pull it down. And I said, no, sir. And he said, we're going to fund a large, uh, we're going to 
bankroll an opponent against you. And I said, you people don't understand. You don't know my district. I don't know where you live, but I, don't, I know you don't live in my district. So do whatever you have to do. And I hung up. For like a week, I had, and I still have these voicemails from that individual, threatening, uh, borderline racist. There was one bill that I voted for uh, that, that dealt with redistricting. And I voted for the district that the Republicans drew because it maintained the integrity of the district. Communities of interest, everything that would help my constituents, I voted for. And he said something like on a voicemail, basically saying that I was voting against the groups that were suing the state. Uh, MALDEF, uh, various Hispanic organizations. And that because I voted against them, when I look in the mirror, I should be ashamed. I'm like, I was like listening to this voicemail, I'm like I'm saving that. <laughs> you saying, cause I'm brown, that somehow I should vote a certain way because I'm brown. Mm -hmm. He's not Hispanic. Uh, he obviously doesn't know our values. And, and I went forward from there. Um, the Democrats at that session were the only ones that have ever threatened me. When I switched parties, arms wide open, um, just like they helped me pass that bill. And that was the only tort reform bill of the session. And I was told by those groups that that was the biggest win that session. And it was an innocuous amendment for my specific constituents. Yeah. Um, and and I, I never looked back. I mean, they made some ugly comments when I switched, like uh, a Hispanic in a Republican primary is like a small fish in a shark tank or something. Mm -hmm. And I would laugh and I would make a comment We'll see. They never said after I won, you were right. Could our nation's biggest geopolitical rival take down our power grid? Four minutes and 37 seconds. That's how close Texas was from a total power grid collapse. Could it be possible that we are helping them do it? How did Texas end up in this position? If we ever got in a war with China, China would attack our electric grid who's in cyber capability. The answer is bigger and worse than I ever imagined. Trey Martinez Fisher, I, I watched an interview that he did when you switched, but before you were reelected, right? He had all these examples of all these people that move and, you know, they're not very friendly to Hispanics over there in the Republican Party and Hispanics won't vote for other Republican Hispanics. And he said, we'll just have to see if he even survives. Um, so it was really funny kind of going back, I was remembering when it happened. So I went back and, and just seeing his interview at the time, realizing the distinction between this kind of doomsday, look, you might go over there, but you're not gonna get reelected. They're gonna, they're gonna elect a white guy was basically what they were implying in the primary. They're like, he can't even survive a primary, let alone the general, the Democrats are gonna stick. Okay, so you left. I know one of the things we're gonna talk about is reforming the Texas House. You have been a unique voice in that. And I want to get to that, but I, I want to first talk about South Texas because you moved to the Republican Party before it was as cool to move to the Republican yeah. Party. And you have now seen since 2016, 2012, really 2012, a little bit, is a steady increase. Mm -hmm. And they're moving rapidly at this point. We are, we are getting to the point to where South Texas on a every election basis is becoming more red. Yes. So I want you, because your family is not just in the Beeville, Kingsville area. You have family down closer to the border as well mm -hmm. on both sides. Explain to me from your vantage point and perspective, what's contributing to that South Texas shift? And do you think that's something that's going to continue? It definitely is continuing. Uh, from, from 2012, when I switched, I had counties, blue counties, that my consultants were saying, you can't win. Don't focus there. Focus on the northern counties where there's more Republicans. And I said, no, I want, I want a block walking list with every voter on it. And then as I block walk, there's certain things I was noticing. Uh, I would see, I mean, I grew up there. So mm -hmm. any, any diesel pickup truck with an oil field sticker on it or, a, or an AR-15 sticker on it, or they vote for the last four primaries in the Democrat primary, but I'm going to go knock. 
And show, I tell them about the Democrat platform. They say, we don't stand for that. And I said, well, at least I would love to earn your vote. It, it, even if it's just me and then everyone else you vote for is not my party. And we started that shift. And so I was the first Republican mm -hmm. to ever win Jim Wells County, box 13 country, very blue. Wow. Um, I got more votes in Jim Wells County than Hillary Clinton got in Jim Wells County. Um, and I showed, uh, hopefully, the media didn't, doesn't cover that. They don't, it doesn't feed their narrative. Yep. Um, but I hope that political experts see how it started. Um, since that point, uh, most recently, Governor Abbott won Jim Wells. Um, Claiborne County uh, now has almost all Republican office holders, uh, Republican sheriff. Um, nearby counties are, are on the way to do that, if not already. Um, and it's just, the, the communities in South Texas most recently have been suffering from the uncontrolled border. Um, people cannot enjoy their property. They cannot sleep at their ranch. They have to go in the day and before it's dark, they've got to leave. Um, it's scary um, to have hundreds of people in a trail walking up when at, at possibly armed or carrying drugs. It's, um, it's a different time today than it was in the 80s when people were just migrating to work in dairies. Um, today, it's people from MS-13 that are coming. Um, it's, it's, very, it's a very scary time. That is showing them that the Democrat administration has failed. Um, and then with respect to inflation, it's just really hurting rural, rural South Texas. So with South Texas Hispanics, when I look at national Democrats, I really think that they have really taken for granted that entire voting demographic, and they have failed to see that the values of the Democrat Party are literally antithetical to the values of South Texas. I mean, you go down there and they all have their family. They're all going to church on Sundays. And it's not just, okay, because people I think will oversimplify, oh, they're Catholic, they're this. It's like, it, it's not simply one or two aspects of their faith. It's the entire way they live their lives. They operate their lives around their family. They hold their jobs for long periods of time. They're working class individuals. They're proud of owning property. They have a, a rural ruggedness to them. I mean, you're in these areas. These are these are not urban New York Times subscribing people. <laughs> and so can you share even in the last several years, any additional insight into people that maybe didn't leave when you left, didn't leave in 2016, but have even in the last several years started to move? Like what, what are, are the turning points that start to move people red, even in the last couple of years, in your opinion? I, I think just because it's so recent is, is the, wow. the whole uh, transgender um, believing that there's more than one gender. Um, it's just, it's gotten out of control. The, 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 just the fact that it's in their platform, it's in the Democrat platform that we should allow parents to have their children's genders, uh, genitals modified is, is insane. Um, that there are actually today self-avowed socialists in Congress that are Democrats. Um, there are Democrats in Congress that advocate for groups that want to destroy Israel. It's, 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 it's crazy. And they don't say that down here because yes. that would not fly in South Texas. And so I, I gladly would debate any Democrat with their platform on a billboard in South Texas. And I want the public to see how extreme they have gotten. They have strayed from the traditional family values that are essentially the backbone of, of civilization to the point where it's leading to problems 
that are now two or three generations in trouble. Um, the Republican Party is trying to solve those problems. And at every turning point, they sue us. They block our laws from being enacted, rightfully so, by the people through the legislature. And they're using the courts, liberal judges. Um, and, and that's the state of affairs right now. Um, but that, that whole debate on child genital mutilation is, it's, in, it's, in, it's insane that we're even having that discussion. You caught the attention of a lot of conservatives in Texas when you co-authored this op-ed that Tony Tinderholt and you wrote together. And this op-ed said a number of things, but in it is when, uh, and, and you had said a number of things about the Ken Paxson impeachment and things like that, that were starting to, I would say, show a separation between you and the current leadership in the Texas House. And I want to give people a little bit of context before I ask you this question. You're the 20th most senior member in the legislature of 150 members. 130 of them have been here less than you, right? So that puts you in the very top echelons of seniority. You have been a chairman under the last three speakers. You were the chairman of higher education, which is a very powerful committee under Joe Strauss. You were chairman of environmental regulations under Dennis Bonin, and just this last session, chairman of urban affairs under Dave Phelan. So you've been in leadership roles in the last three speakerships. You're one of the 20 most senior members of the legislature. You've served in the Democrat Party and the Republican Party. Um, you came out and talked about the need for a new speaker and some of the actions that happened last session. Can you talk just a little bit about what led you to that point? What, at what point during the session or during the special sessions did you decide something here needs to change? It started, um, I would say, my second session under Dade Phelan. Um, the, the previous session, my first session with him as, as speaker, um, I had a local bill that was important uh, for industrial development, uh, oil and gas exploration, refineries. And it's a, a bill that would just add two more port commissioners from the county that I represented on a, on a, where all the growth has been in my county. They only have one on the port commission. Common sense, the governor's office supported it. Um, I never even got a hearing. Never even got a hearing. I of course, I went to the speaker's office. Um, and our chair at the time, uh, well, currently is a, a Democrat, and he's a friend of mine. Um, but I expected the speaker's office to see, one, it's a local bill. But two, this is a fellow Republican. It's a Republican majority in the House. I'm going to help him. No. I'm going to help the Democrat. So second session, the same thing happens. The same thing. I just wanted a hearing. This last session, the same thing happens. Never even got a hearing. I had to change a bill to do nothing just to get a hearing. It's, it's insane. Um, and so there is no respect for our local districts if you are not in the good graces of the current speaker, yep. uh, if you didn't do something for him, like special, I, I don't know. Uh, I seriously, to this day, don't know what I have to do to get a hearing on a bill that's for my district. I, you're willing to say some of these things publicly. I've heard this from a lot of members that our chairman are still, you would still think of these people as with Dade Phelan. Right. I mean, these are people who are not haven't publicly said anything about Democrat chairs or anything like that. Some of them are powerful chairman in the House and they would tell you, I don't know why my bill died. I don't know why this Democrat chair never got a hearing. I don't know who put pressure on who. Mm -hmm. I don't know why it was in calendars. I don't know why it was on the last page. There seems to be this consistency you hear from people that just talk about with the existing leadership. Even people who are chairman, you're a chairman under Dade Phelan. 
you still don't know why certain bills are moving, why they're dying, and you really don't even know who all does know. And, and the key part there is something that the public really doesn't think about. We sacrifice to be here. Um, many of us, it cost us money because this pays $600 a month. I lose money in my businesses every time I'm in session. It's six figures, okay? And I do it because of my heart. I love my communities. And so the leadership disrespects us by not giving our constituents a voice. They can't even have a hearing. And so I've heard that from many members, the lack of communication, the disrespect of us leaving our families, driving four hours, seven hours to the Capitol to gavel in for four minutes and we're out for five days. It's like, let us know. It's, it's horrible management. And, and, and as, a, as a, a business owner with over 100 employees, I hire and fire people for mismanagement all the time. This is mismanagement. And the buck stops with the speaker, he must be fired. We cannot disrespect House members anymore, anymore, period. Second, when you withhold information from the legislature that is exculpatory with respect to Ken Paxton. For example, this impeachment process was rushed. They put us in a room, all the chairs, Republican chairs, and Chairman Murr, the chair of investigations, pitches to us the charges, and we walk out like confused because there was no witnesses. Uh, there was no testimony from A.G. Paxton. I specifically asked, was there a contractor that said, yeah, he paid me to remodel his kitchen. And he told me, we have subpoenas out for that. But there is an affidavit signed by someone that said that they overheard that or saw that. All right, but I thought subpoenas out, wow, there's something there. For two years, there had been investigations, whistleblowers, federal agencies uh, questioning people. Someone knew before we found out in the Senate trial that the kitchen was never even remodeled. Talk about exculpatory. Yeah. Bribery for remodeling his kitchen and in the Senate trial, the kitchen was never remodeled. Or that he paid for the construction work done at the apartment and there's a check, a copy of a check that shows that he paid for it. That would have saved us a lot of time and grief. Even though I didn't know that, when I voted for the impeachment, I put a statement in the journal that criticized the process. And I knew leadership was not gonna be happy but I did it because that, was, that is what was right at the moment. It only became even more right later. Um, and and so to this day, we have people that lost re-election because our current leader marched them out into an ambush, willfully. That's unforgivable. And as the leader, the, the buck stops with him, we need to fire him. That's just the way it is in business. Get someone in there that's gonna do the job right, that's gonna have his whole heart in the job, that's gonna communicate and put us to work. We can't be taking five day breaks. The people expect us to be here to work. Second, the majority of Texans, uh, the Republican party, grassroots conservatives are demanding us to not appoint Democrat chairs. We owe it to our communities, those that put us in office to deliver on that. Those that don't, they saw what happened the last primary. And I have talked to enough of my colleagues, those that have signed the letters of no Dem chairs, to a handful that are going to be supporting no Dem chairs. And there are enough there to block Dade Phelan from getting the caucus nomination. There are enough there. No one needs to be afraid. That is what is right, and that is what the people demand of us, and we must deliver. 
Before I get to reforms, because you have supported a lot of reforms for the process, regardless of who the next speaker is, one of the things you often hear from people who are still with Dade is that he was always picked by Republicans, that Republicans are the ones who chose him, that the Republican caucus is the nomination he got. That's how he became speaker. And when I talk to you, I hear a different story. And so I think it would be helpful for you to explain to people whether you believe that Dade was originally selected when he became speaker by Republicans through the Republican caucus process. At what point, because uh, you hear this version that basically says he got all these Republicans together, and then once he got in a bunch of Republicans, he was kind of the nominee, then some Democrats came on board. So what's your version of how that went down? Um, first time he was running, I had never really spoken to him. Uh, and I'm talking about like on the House floor, much less on the phone or anything. Um, so someone asked me if I had spoken with Dade Phelan because he's, he's probably gonna be the next speaker. And so I called him, uh, was talking to him. He said, well, JM, um, if, if you're in Austin, and I said, no, I'm not, I'm, I'm in my district, but uh, I might go up to Austin. He goes, well, when you come up, uh, come to this hotel um, and, and just call us when you're here. So when I go up, um, I walk into a room and there's an, on a hand, you know, you could, a handful of people in this room. There were an equal number of Democrats in that room than Republicans. I think it was like, maybe it was like four Republicans and three Democrats. And everyone was calling, Democrats were calling Democrats and Republicans were calling Republicans um, to get them to support the speaker. And so, uh, Dade Phelan. And so from the beginning, it was, uh, trying to get Democrat support and, and getting such a large number to where the other Republicans running, uh, Trent Ashby, Jeannie Morrison, um, I, I, perhaps Phil there King. Were, yep, there were several others. Phil yeah. might not have still been in the race at that point, but yes, there were several people running. When you say, I've got 60 Democrats, they're, okay, they're, they're slowly bowing out. And that, that that's just the way that, that's how that play was run. Yeah. It cannot be done like that anymore. The people have demanded a change. Uh, we have a Republican majority. Uh, we must elect the speaker within our own caucus. And currently, there are not enough votes in our caucus for Dade Phelan to be reelected as and be the choice of the caucus. You, I want to make sure it's clear to people. At the point in time that you sat down with Dade, nobody told you they already had 76 votes. So they didn't tell you, we have the votes, you're, you're the 90th, like they're talking to you to get your support to be part of the 76 that are gonna elect the next speaker. Dade had a press conference at some point where he said, the race for speaker is over. Dennis Bonin did something very similar, and I believe you are on both lists when they ultimately did get elected. They said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna win, here's the 80 people that are supporting me. And of those 80, there are 40 or 50 Republicans 30 Democrats, and that's basically the coalition that elects these people. Um, I, I feel like that side tends to like to rewrite history and tell this story where the, every Republican on this list, we basically got before we talked to any Democrats, which is, even in that case, it's a problem, mm -hmm. but that's often how they retell the story. And I, that's why I appreciate you at least going on and you've protected the names of the identities of whoever was there. I think you respect um, a lot of your colleagues on both sides, but you were in a room and there are Democrats and Republicans in this room and they're both calling each other's part members trying to pitch them to support Dade. Yeah, and writing the name on an eraser board Yep. to get a tally. Yep, to get up to 76. Get up to 76. Yep. And, and that's the thing is, he did it, own it. Yeah. Yeah, he was elected that way the first time. Next go around. Do it with only Republicans. Mm -hmm. I mean, why stick to the same playbook when your constituents are demanding change? Yep. Why double down on a failed attempt to impeach the most popular attorney general in Texas, uh, in the country? Yep. Why double down on that failed attempt, burn the relationship with the Senate, disrespect in many ways our governor, and, and just obliterate 
the relationship with the lieutenant governor. We need to unite again. We cannot continue to be broken. The Democrats will do whatever they can to win, and they will win if we are divided. That's their playbook. Playing into that, you might as well be on their team. And, and the grassroots, the Republican primary voters have spoken loud and clear, and they're gonna speak even louder and louder and louder. Um, and we need to pass conservative legislation that's not watered down. Um, we need to elect we need to elect a speaker that's going to respect the members, respect their time, respect the sacrifice. I remember one of my colleagues next to me was showing me a picture of his son um, from his baseball game. And it was his first baseball game, Little League, and he had missed it. And he was so proud of his son and he had tears in his eyes. I've missed a lot of time with my kids and I'm just catching up. I, I, there's, I wish I could have those years back. I want it to be worth it. Like that old saying, it, it, it has to be worth the squeeze. I want it to be worth it. And as long as we are essentially cast aside for a power grab, not only do we lack a purpose, which we represent our people, so now our people lack a purpose, but we're going against what our government structure is. We might as well just have a king. The speaker's role should be one that caters to the members, someone that facilitates meetings, friendships, that gives them uh, clarity on a calendar, uh, that puts them to work Monday through Friday or Monday through Thursday, whatever, but none of this five-day weekend stuff. I mean, we're only here every other year. It, time is of the essence. Um, and then when it comes to the most significant conservative priorities and you're a Republican speaker, you cannot kill that legislation, especially if it sails through the Senate. Yep. That, that's another representative arm of government. The people spoke loud and clear, and then somehow it dies in the House. It, it doesn't... It doesn't uh, match the other, and there's obviously a, a, a systemic problem. Uh, I know that you've you signed the contract with Texas, and on it are several of the things you've articulated here. You, may, you said, we've got to get to work sooner, right? The five-day weekends, they come in. You know, members in the House like to talk about how much work they do, but leadership designs it to where y'all are only able to do a certain amount of work. When they send everyone home for five days at a time for months on end, you come in March and all of a sudden everyone's catching up. You appoint committees very late in the process. Then the committees organize very late in the process. You're going home a lot. Um, you've talked about Republican priorities coming to the floor, which is part of these reforms that need to take place. The calendar, you, you hit on the calendar a little bit. These guys need to, the, the speaker's job is to just kind of help organize this calendar where the calendars committee now is a very non-transparent process where nobody really knows what's going on. Nobody knows exactly what we're gonna do. I mean, you and other Republican chairs couldn't tell people what's gonna be on the floor 36 hours before the floor, right? Yeah. We don't know, they're gonna meet in some basement somewhere, gonna come out, our staff might be texting us, oh, your bill's on the calendar. I didn't know. <laughs> so it's this real, it's intentionally that way, it's not transparent. And uh, therefore, people don't even know how to make plans about how much work they're gonna do, how late the days are gonna go. So you've advocated for a lot of these different reforms and you're coming from a position of somebody who's been here a long time. You have, by anybody in politics definition, succeeded in this system. You've been a chair under three speakers and all that. So my question is what, at what point, talk to me about where you're at today, maybe is the way I'm, I'm trying to get to this question. Because these are not things that you just started noticing three or four months ago, right? You have noticed them throughout. But some people get to Austin, this is the way I say it is that they kind of decide how they're going to operate. Some people operate and say, I don't think, they might just say, I'm going to convince myself that all these things are just good, right? Whether they are or not. And I'll just operate under that. Quite a few people will say, I don't think this is good. I don't think this is how it should happen. I don't know if I can change it. And so I'm just going to operate under these rules that everyone's telling me to operate under. And I'll get done what I can get done. And then some people either later in their career or early come in and say, I would like to try to change the way this is working. Now, 
I'm a fan of term limits for the sake, for the reason that I see people get elected and a lot of them start with kind of some fire in their belly and over time, they just kind of move to the middle. You are the anomaly. You are one of the 20 most senior members of the legislature. You came in and operated by a lot of the unwritten rules of this chamber and have now come out. So what is that like? Because I don't know, to be honest. Yeah. What is it like to have operated under these rules and then finally come out and say, I really don't think this is how we should work? Explain that to me. Well, first, for, for my house colleagues that are watching, they know me as someone that's always making people laugh. Yep. Uh, I love making people happy. Um, I try to avoid conflict mm. just by nature. Uh, I know what we sacrifice to be there, and I don't want to dwell on some failure that they've had. Uh, I try to change the subject. Um, I'm also reserved. Uh, I rarely go to the mic, but when I do, it's for something very important. I went up there on, on uh, border security legislation, voter ID, um, election uh, integrity, um, and I guess they know now that for a very long time I've been holding my tongue, yep. um, being respectful of, of leadership, not trying to um, not trying to to transform something that's been happening for ten years. I mean that I've seen. I mean, I'm, but it. I was thirty when I got here. I'm forty four now. People that don't agree with what I think uh, on reforming that are 65 plus, they're gonna be retired very, very soon. I mean, it's just, just with age, unless you're Tom Craddock, <laughs> who can go forever. Yeah, you're gonna be here the 2040. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, 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 would, I would love to, now that I see what I've sacrificed and the time I've lost with my children, I would love to reform what we have to make it more efficient. Just, I'm a business owner. Efficiency is key. Government by nature is inefficient. When we make government efficient, it operates better. And it's, it's that simple. And so um, I just can't hold my tongue anymore. It's, I've heard the gripes among my colleagues as we're going on, like, oh, did, did we really just gavel out after three minutes? Yeah. Yeah, well, you wanna go grab a bite? Now I'm gonna go home, you know, <laughs> like I got five hours to drive. Yes. Yep. Just basic things like that. Or like we're here for the first week for a grand ceremony with our families and everything. Um, and after we, we get down to do the rules on the house floor, and then everyone essentially goes home. And when we could, we know after November who the membership is composed of. Yep. You could have in that first week committee assignments. Yep. Then you can get the budgets assigned to those new chairmen. They can hire committee clerks and it starts much sooner. That's mm -hmm. just the way, because it can be that way. It's mind boggling that it, that it hasn't. Yep. Um, and the people are demanding it now. Like before it was just stuff that we'd say among ourselves, the people know. And it's like, some of these things are actually in the Republican party platform now. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not, um, and, and, and I'm very grateful to them for that because they're holding us accountable the way it should work. Um, I was also one of the only ones that early on signed on to a resolution to apologize to Ken Paxton. Yes. I felt during the trial uh, in the Senate that we had made a major mistake in the House. What came out in the Senate was just mind boggling. Uh, how could we have proceeded with something so weak, um, at lightning speed, it, it was irresponsible, it was mismanaged from the beginning. It's only reasonable to apologize to the man whose wife was in the room and had to hear allegations of, uh, of infidelity, things that, um, it's not about his work. Mm. He sues Washington, he protects Texas, he does a great job at it, and instead they wanna run him over and, and put him and his family through great distress. 
for things that are not impeachable. It's, it was an abuse of the system. Mm. And I hope that we reform that next session because we cannot weaponize that system to political enemies uh, or, or anything. It's, it's got to be fair to all. I want to close with, with this question. Um, in the Republican Party, we have these factions, right? And there are various factions people fall in. It's not one or two or three or four. There's just a lot of different factions. Simply, though, there, there are the kind of grassroots conservative Republicans, the party, some of our statewides who fall in that group, and then the more establishment type Republicans. Okay, those are two of the definitions. And then you and I know that there are 15 other factions inside of all of that. I would like to know for you, because you are somebody who has not always voted with the more conservative side on different issues um, of your career, you've been in both parties. What has the reaction been? Because you know the conservative activists in your district, right? Mm -hmm. And you know the ones that you go to Republican clubs and they complain to you and jam, why'd you vote for that thing? Why'd you do this amendment? Why'd you get that bad rating? Yes. What has their reaction been? Because you haven't voted differently, but you have come out in the course of the interim and started to voice some of these concerns and desire to reform. So what happens in your district when you say that? Um, I, I just think that would be interesting to know and I'll, uh, because my, my encouragement to Texans, I wanna preface this and then I'd like your answer, is I have tried to encourage conservative activists to always reach out to their legislator, regardless of whether they are voting the way they want them to or not. Mm -hmm. Now, I think you are different in that you have always been respectful. You've always been honest. You've always been transparent and approachable by your constituents. Some people will vote more moderate and then they will, you know, not meet with those individuals. They'll attack them online and they do other stuff. So that it wasn't the same. I do understand that to some extent, some people will say, well, this guy's really attacking me for all these various reasons. But just because somebody is voting in a way on an amendment or a bill that you don't think is in line, does not mean that they're not willing to work with you. And I would just like you to explain what has been your reaction, what has been the reaction you've gotten from all these conservatives that you know in your district since you've at least just come out and talked about some of the problems in the house. To be honest, what the, the first thing I noticed, this, this may have been a silver lining to my bad vote uh, on the impeachment because folks that had never called our office were blowing up our phones. I'm the kind that, especially when they're very angry, I'll get the number and I'll, I'll call them. Um, I'm, I'm on the road a lot. And whether it's between my businesses or, or going back to the district and back up. And I became very good friends with them. Of course, at the very beginning, it was like, even, if, even in person, very cold, very angry. But as we sit and talk just by nature, that's my job, uh, I, I believe, is I work for them. And so I'm not going to just tell them, oh, you're wrong, and then just walk away. No, I'm going to say, let's, let's sit down and talk more, but like a little calmer because I'm on your side. We go from the impeachment to all these other votes. I loved how informed these constituents are. I mean, they, they down to the amendments on certain votes I had, I didn't even remember. <laughs> And I, they're like showing me, I'm like, ma'am, I'm, I'm going to have to check why I voted. For, like, I'll, I'll give you an example. On the budget, there were amendments that were funding some kind of education program or something with a university. Something that, to me, is, it doesn't look bad. Well, there's experts that analyze what that would do to the budget. And it's, it's bad fiscal policy. There's some education expenses that, we cannot do without. Majority of them uh, are the kind that you put money in, in education, the state gets back seven to $10 in the future. They're phenomenal. There's some that's kind of like, uh, I don't know, that, that program might only have three students in it, but you want to fully fund like 20 million for it. You know, it's, and so from this constituent, I learned how to show fiscal restraint, how to be fiscally responsible. And I told her, Ma'am, I'm a business owner. I, I am. Well, you're up there playing with my money. Completely 
paradigm shift in my brain. I started seeing things differently. Like it is, it's her money. And I'm possibly creating what, more wasteful spending. Um, and so that's one thing. They, they rate us on a lot of those votes and I've got very, very poor ratings on some of those groups. It's gonna be completely different next session because of these constituents that have educated me on issues that honestly I hadn't even, I hadn't, I hadn't heard from them. Um, now they know that there's an open dialogue. Um, I explain a lot to them, a lot of the inside baseball too. Uh, I've dispelled some myths too. Yes. Because uh, there's a lot of uncertainty. They don't know what we do up here. And I tell them, well, it's not really like that. I promise you, it's not like that. You know, and, and they actually have someone in me now that they, they're comfortable speaking with. And they see that one, I'm not, I'm not set on a, on a mindset that will never change. The, the, the will of our voters, their priorities change with time. And so ours must as well. And, and uh, so to any colleague out there who doesn't like some of these organizations that rate them lower down on the, on the scale, um, they need to know that it's okay to explain why you've voted a certain way and how you're gonna do it different. Again, our electorate is very forgiving when we show that we're genuine, that no one is perfect. Um, and, and, and we tell our voters just shoot straight. I mean, it's, but by no means, like I've seen some of my colleagues uh, who currently still support leadership, they don't even talk to those groups. They shut them out. They block them on social media. Um, they, they kick them out of their offices. I mean, they work for them. It's, and they will not come back because the, the people of Texas, conservative voters are a clean house. And that's just the way it is. Uh, for, for, and it's a good thing. Um, and it's gonna make Texas better and stronger. We do need to unify and to make sure that Texas remains red. You said one thing that I want to close on. You said the only way the Democrats win is if we're divided. That's right. Right? That's right. So, and you've been a Democrat. You've yeah. been in the caucus <laughs> yeah. meetings, right? Oh my and, gosh, yeah. Uh, you told them we should stop being progressive. So you're the, you've been in the caucus meetings. You understand that they know they're the minority and the only way they win is if they can convince 15 or 20 or 25 Republicans, do a deal with us. Keep a bipartisan uniparty coalition together where we run a lot of the House and you run some of the House and we kill a bunch of bills. That's the only way the Democrats win. Mm -hmm. And I'm encouraged by the fact that you and Tony Tinderholt and so many other Republicans, some publicly, some privately, some one-on-one, -on -one, some in group settings are all saying similar things to say, guys, it is time for the Republican caucus to come together and pick a Republican leader without Democrats. And then we will be more in line and less at odds with the Republican Party of Texas, with the Lieutenant Governor, with the Governor, and with all these different people. I love what you shared uh, about the silver lining to just saying, hey, I think I made a bad vote, is that all these people in your district who basically probably had written you off. Yeah. I don't, this guy doesn't vote the way I want him to vote. I'm not calling his office. You know, I'll have people sometimes I'll say, um, hey, if you really care about that bill, call the five Republican state reps on that committee. And they'll say, well, I already know that guy. He doesn't listen to me. And so they don't call. So you're, you're, that point of the silver lining is these people weren't even reaching out to you. They weren't talking. Now all of a sudden you say, hey, I wish I had voted a different way knowing what I know now. And they reach out thanking you. And that now opens up this dialogue that leads to all of their different views and your views coming together and saying, hey, I want to be more in line with what your values are. So Jam, I can't tell you how encouraged I am by the work that you've done during the interim. Um, I think you've challenged even me and other people on this side of the Republican Party to say we need to continue to work to have open communication, honest dialogue. Um, so I appreciate that. I also think that your voice is, is essential in this chamber. And uh, I just, I can't tell you how grateful I am for the honesty that you've not only displayed in this conversation, but just really throughout the interim. Thank you, Luke. It's an honor to be on your show. I'm a big fan already, so. <laughs> but it's an honor to finally be on your show. And I look forward to working with you and, and grassroots conservatives around the state. Thanks, Steve.
Yeah, you got it. Do you want to get your news from people who share your values? Texas Scorecard, real news for real Texans. Yeah.